All right, how's it going? Welcome back to another video here in the series on group theory. You might have noticed that out of the, the one thing that is written on the board here, being the, the name of the video series and the section title, is that we have a new section title, right? We've been talking about quotient groups now for the past couple of videos, and now we are moving on to this section called group actions. And that's always good, right, to be able to say. Uh, we're slowly but surely moving through the, the course. So before we, we dive into this new section here on group actions, what I, I want to do first is to just kind of summarize what we've been doing up until this point. So that way, this new section will sort of make sense in the context of, of everything we've been doing so far. So in the, the very beginning, kind of the first two sections, we had the, the goal of first introducing what a group was, right? So a group is a set that satisfies these four axioms with a binary operation. And then we talked about homomorphisms, these functions that map from one group into another, which preserve the overall structure of a group. And, and then after that, we went through some specific examples of groups, right? We went through cyclic groups, dihedral groups, the symmetric group, as well as some common infinite groups like the integers under addition or uh, the, the real numbers under uh, the real numbers without zero under multiplication and some of, some of these common ones, right? So that's kind of what we spent the, the beginning of the video series doing, just introducing groups and some examples of them. Then the next couple of sections, which were on Lagrange's theorem and quotient groups, which led up to the isomorphism theorem, you notice we were developing a lot of tools, these algebraic tools that we could use to talk about these big theorems, meaning Lagrange's theorem and the isomorphism theorem. So that's kind of, it's been like a second half in a sense, right? Where we, we were saying, okay, now we're establishing these major results. And, and it might feel like, like this, this is good, of course, to establish these results, right? These are very general statements that we can uh, use to talk about a group and the, the structure of, of its subgroups, if you will. So, so this is good, but, but I think when we have a tendency, I think there's a tendency at least, when, when we talk about these big theorems, right, that we tend to think that maybe, or we tend to get carried away in our heads, at least when I was first learning the subject, I, I did, that group theory is all about these big theorems. And sometimes we can lose picture, or we can lose scope of the, the big picture of things. And if I wanna take you guys back to the very beginning of the video series where we, we can imagine if somebody were to ask us the question of, well, what is group theory, right? What, what is this series of videos that you're watching here on YouTube? And the, the simple, concise answer that, that is probably the most concise way of describing group theory is to say that group theory is simply the study of symmetries, right? And we've, although we've been talking about that kind of throughout the video series, when we either talk about cyclic groups, if we think of CN, uh, or we think of the dihedral group, D2N, or, or the symmetric group, SN, all of these types, these fundamental types of finite groups, we can imagine in our heads how these groups would correspond to some sort of symmetry. And let's just go through them really quickly. Starting with CN, the cyclic group, we can imagine the cyclic group, and maybe I could even just write it out really quickly. I don't think I'll do it with the other two just to be concise, but this would be E, A, A squared, where A is the generator of the group, all the way through A to the N minus one. And then of course, once you get to A to the N, you loop back around to the identity element. So these would be the elements of the cyclic group CN. But physically, what they could possibly correspond to are the rotational symmetries of a regular N-sided polygon, right? So we can imagine that, that the element A would be a rotation of 360 degrees divided by N, right? So if, if we had C3, this would be a, a rotation of 120 degrees, so kind of like the rotational symmetries of a triangle. And we can think of each of these elements as a corresponding symmetry. That's the big picture, right? So, so that's what we can think of with, with CN, D2N, by definition, the dihedral group 
This corresponds to all the possible symmetries of a regular n-sided polygon. So it would include n rotations, but it would also include n different reflections too. So we can hopefully make sense of the fact that the elements of D2n correspond to some symmetry, some action that leaves an object appearing unchanged. And then finally with Sn, the symmetric group, I think that's probably the most clear just based off of the name, that the symmetric group is simply going to be all possible symmetries of a set that has n elements, right? So every element of the symmetric group, like we were talking about, literally corresponded to some symmetry, which we uh, generally expressed as a permutation on a set of, of n elements, right? So, so, so with these, what, what I'm trying to say is that with these types of finite groups, it can be clear to us how its elements correspond to a symmetry. However, when we start talking about some types of infinite groups that, that have been relatively common, whether it's the integers under addition, or maybe right, r star, the real numbers without zero under multiplication, and I were to ask you, well, what what do the elements of these groups correspond to? What, what are this, what symmetries, I should say, do the elements of these groups correspond to? And it might not be so, so easy to, to see what these ele the elements of these groups correspond to in terms of a symmetry. And, and these are just some infinite examples. You can imagine I could just take an arbitrary finite group that may not be written as explicitly as, as these three cases right here. And it might not be so obvious how the elements of that group correspond to a given symmetry, a given action that leaves an object appearing unchanged. So that's kind of what we're going to say. Okay, well, let's, let's take a, a deeper look at that. That's what the, the motivation is, at least, for this new section uh, title. What we want to, to make very clear in, throughout this section is to say, how do the elements of some group correspond to a given symmetry? And the, the first step into answering that is to talk about these things called group actions. So it's, it's just convenient that the section title happens to be what we're going to be introducing in this very first video. But I hope that is a, a decent enough motivation as to, to what we are going to be doing and, and how it fits into the scope with, with what we've done so far. Okay. So, so hopefully that makes sense. Now, to actually get started with, with new stuff, right? what I want to do is I want to, to say, well, if we're going to talk about group actions, let's first define what a group action is. So I'm going to write out the definition here for a group action, and then we're going to go through that together. Okay, so we have the, the definition here for a group action. Let's go through it together. So it first says, let X be a set and G be a group. Then we can say that there is an action of G on the set X. If we have a homomorphism, which we're going to call phi, which maps from G into this thing, sim of X. And again, this is the symmetric group or the set of all symmetries acting on this set X right here. And just in case we forgot this notation, in the case where X has N elements in, in the set, so the size of X is N, then the symmetric group, sim of X, would simply be S of N, okay? So, so, so that's all that means. It's just corresponding to the, the symmetric group right here. So, so how do we make sense of this definition? Because we could say, all right, a group action is, is some sort of homomorphism, but why is that important? And I think probably the, the clearest way to understand this is to maybe have, I'll split the board in two here. Is that, let's see, just, yeah, marker's working okay. <laughs> split the board in two, have a specific example that we've already seen over here and have the generalization over here. So to start with the, just setting up the generalization, let's just say I have an element of my general, my arbitrary group G, and I'll call it little g. And I have an element of my arbitrary set, which I'll call little x, 
So this will be the setup, but let's, let's now go over here to the, the specific example. What I want to do is I want to look at the dihedral group D6, kind of this group that we've been seeing a couple times now in, in these videos. So it's going to be E R R squared S R S R squared S like this. And we have to ask ourselves, what is this group correspond to physically? Well, it corresponds to the symmetries of a regular three-sided polygon or a regular triangle. It's supposed to be a regular triangle, not exactly. But, um, right, so, so, so the idea is that what we're doing is we have an element of the group like R, and this group element corresponds to a rotation of the triangle by 120 degrees. And S, that is another group element, that corresponds to reflecting the triangle across a given axis. So what we, we would like to do though is to say this is one specific instance of that property, but how do we do this in general? How do we take a general group element and correspond that to some general symmetry on not just a triangle, but just on an arbitrary set? How can we generalize this as much as possible? And that's what really what a group action is doing. It just generalizes this right here. And the way that it does that is it, say, it says, let's take a group element G and we would like to relate G to some sort of symmetry. And what is the group of all symmetries of a set? Well, let's just sim of X, right? So if we have, let's write this. If we have sigma and sim of X, because we typically denote elements of the symmetric group with Greek letters, the, the permutations, right? What we're saying then is that if this is a, a symmetry or a permutation, then all phi is doing, all the group action is doing is it's saying, what, let's take this group element and relate it to a symmetry. Just like here, let's take this element and relate it to a rotation. Let's take this element and relate it to a reflection. And the, the way that that it preserves the group structure too, so we're not breaking any structure is by ensuring that it's a homomorphism. So that's all we're doing here. Really a group action is saying, let's take a group element, correspond it to some symmetry of some set. Very general way of, of talking about groups and how they can uh, really be objects that, that study symmetries. Okay. So, so, so hopefully this makes sense. Now, you, you can imagine too that because a group action is simply a homomorphism, there is not just a single homomorphism from some group into some symmetric group of X, right? I could, I could also have maybe another homomorphism, and maybe I'll call it, I don't know, theta. And theta could take in the same group element, but this, but this, uh, this homomorphism could correspond to a different symmetry on the set of uh, elements in X. Maybe if, if, if phi takes in the group element and spits out sigma, maybe a different group action will take in the same element and spit out tau. So, so the idea is that with, with a group action, there's not just one way that you can relate an element of a group to a corresponding symmetry. And that's kind of a new piece that, that we haven't seen here so far, right? Because in this case, we've always thought of R as just a rotation of the triangle. We've always thought of S as just a reflection of the triangle. But here we're saying that's just one way of mapping a group element to some symmetry. But, but there are other ways that you could do that, and that's just by defining another homomorphism. Okay. So I want to make that distinction clear as well. There is not always just a single map in general, there will not be a single mapping from a group element to a given symmetry. All right. So hopefully this makes sense. Uh, it turns out though that there is another way of, of describing a group action rather than just a homomorphism from G into the symmetric group of X. And in order to do that, let's see, I think I want to erase this right here. We're gonna get into that other sort of way of representing a group action. But I would like to imagine for a second how the, the function phi acts 
on elements of G goes into the symmetric group of X. I want to imagine actually applying these various functions that we have set up here so far. So we have G and G, X and X, and then we'll have sigma and sim of X. And we're going to start with an, our domain, G, little g, or an element of the domain, little g. Phi is now going to act on little g, right? And when phi acts on little g, that sends it to the codomain, sim of x. But let's remind ourselves, what is sim of x? It's a symmetric group, and the elements of the symmetric group are inherently permutations. Well, permu and, and we then ask ourselves, well, what's a permutation? Well, a permutation is itself a function. A, a permutation is a bijection from a set into itself, right? So if phi of g equals sigma, because sigma is in the symmetric group, we have to also keep in mind that sigma itself is a function. Not just that it's an element of sigma of x, but it's also a function that is a bijection from x into x. So another way of saying this is that if little x is an element of a set, sigma takes in little x and might spit out little y, where y is also in our set right here. So what does that correspond to with this notation? Phi, phi can take in g, but phi of g takes in x. And hence, you sometimes might see this notation right here, phi of g of x. Okay, and that admittedly can be a little bit confusing. And, and to make matters, unfortunately, sometimes more confusing if not explained, sometimes people don't want to write phi of g of x. And instead, they want to use a more compact notation. Because after all, the group element should correspond to some symmetry. And that symmetry should, should manipulate the, the set element in some way, shape, or form. Kind of like if, if the set element was this triangle vertex, the group element R would rotate it over to here. So sometimes a more compact way, you'll, you'll see both of these notations. You'll see 5G of X, and sometimes you'll also just see the abbreviated version G of X. These two are the same notations. They describe the exact same thing. Okay, but this is just kind of a more compact way of describing this, and this is really the, the, what's actually going on here. Okay? Where G is the, the input to phi, and then X, the set element, is the input to phi of G. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. There's a lot going on. And it, Maybe take some time to think about it too if it's confusing. It definitely can be at first. But this is some notation. We're going to see both of these uh, somewhat frequently, both uh, in the video series and on the problem sets. Now, with, with all of this in mind, <laughs> there is another way of representing a group action. And, and I wanted to introduce this notation right here because the next way that we can represent a group action is going to involve this type of notation. And maybe let me even write all of this up here really quickly. Uh, actually, you know what, I'll, I'll do it as I'm fast forwarding through everything. But, but the reason why I'm introducing this is because the next representation uh, will, it will be useful to know this, I should say, for the next representation. So let me write that out on the board and then we'll go through that next. All right, so we now have this second sort of way of representing a group action down here. And I, I think I wanna mention that it's admittedly that there's a lot going on, right? And there's a lot of stuff on the, on the whiteboard, but, but even with this, this definition, or this other way of representing a group action below, I think it can be a little bit confusing and a little bit abstract if it's not clarified. So my intention here is to go through 
what this claim is, but also just to say, okay, what are they really saying? And, th and then at the end, just to summarize this so we get the main point out of uh, what a group action is. Because once we do that, we're going to go through a couple of examples for, for gr group actions, and then we'll, we'll finish out the video there. But still, let's, let's go through this, this claim because it is mentioned at least in the notes. So first thing, it says that the first way that we can talk about a group action, this original homomorphism phi going from G into sim X, is considered a group action if and only if we have this, this new function theta, and theta takes uh, or has a domain of G cross X, the Cartesian product uh, between G and X. And it takes G cross X into X. And the way that this function is defined is, is like this. So if it has two inputs from the domain, the first input is from the group G, hence little g. The second input is from the, the set X, hence little x. So domain, and then it's going to um, spit out this quantity right here. And if you remember from the, the previous whiteboard, that's what I, I've written <laughs> up here, phi of g of x is the same thing as, as saying that uh, this guy is, is just like sigma, so this is sigma of x or just y, I guess, kind of the, the output element of the set. Okay, so, so maybe we could even put y right here. So essentially, if, if phi is a group action, another way of saying that is that there's this function theta. And defined like this, and theta is going to satisfy these three properties. Now, these properties admittedly can look abstract. So what I, I would like to do is just to use kind of the simplified notation for a group action that we mentioned up here. Because as you're gonna see later on in, in the upcoming videos, this is really gonna be kind of the predominant one that we're gonna be looking at. Okay, so let, let's still go through these, these these properties that this function theta would need to satisfy. The first is that for any group element and for any set element, when theta acts on g comma x, that needs to be an element of the overall set big X. And this is kind of just a, I guess like a, a official sort of abstract way of saying something that we already know. And, and here's what I mean. We, we've already, explained that phi acts on g and then phi of g is a permutation which acts on x and because we can think of sigma or phi of g as a permutation it takes in an element little x from the set big x and it spits out another element from the set y okay so so all this is saying right here is that the value of this guy right here, of phi of g of x, whether we call it that or we call it theta of g comma x, the output needs to be an element of the set. In other words, this needs to be, y needs to be an element of the set x. And the reason why we, we already know that is because sigma is a permutation, right? So, so sigma inherently is defined as being a bijection from x into x. The codomain has to be the set x. Basically, the zeroth axiom or requirement is to say that the codomain of sigma is x. It's really all it's saying. The second, uh, or I guess the, the first, that was the zeroth one. The, the, the first official, I guess, property is to say that for any element of the set, theta of e comma x is equal to x. Now, let's just untangle what theta e comma x means using this more compact notation right here. If, if we were to use a more compact notation, this would get simplified uh, in the following way. Here's theta of g of x, and we say, okay, what's theta of g comma x? That is phi of g of x. Well, what's another way of writing phi of g of x using the simplified notation? Well, that's what we have up here, right? We said phi of g of x is the same thing as g of x. So if theta of g comma x corresponds to just g of x, then theta of e comma x corresponds to just e of x. So another way of saying this, this first official property right here, maybe I'll do it 
on that side, just because it looks like there's a little more room here, would just simply be saying that e of x equals x. What this is telling us is that when we are working with a group action, when a group element acts on a set element, if the group element is the identity, it has to map whatever set element it inputs to itself as the output. Okay. This is kind of thought of the, as like the identity uh, property for a group action. Okay. So that's all this is saying right here. Now, this, this second property right here, it says for any elements G and H in the group, so for any two group elements and for any set element, little x, it's kind of like a composite set of functions. Theta of G comma theta of H comma X equals theta of G H comma X. And that can be kind of a mouthful to say, and it's, it's a lot to, to, to read, right? So let's just, again, use the simplifying notation to say what, what do they really, really mean here? So the first thing is that theta of H comma X, let's write this here, theta of H comma X can simply be thought of as H of X like this. And then theta of G comma H of X could simply be rewritten as G of H of X like this. So what they're really saying, using this simplified notation, and I'll write it down here, is that G of H of X is simply going to be the product GH. Let me let me make some more room. The prod or G of H of X is simply going to be GH of X like this. And what they're trying to say in words is that because G and H are group elements, right? So if, if we think of these group elements as applying various symmetries. What they're saying is that if we perform, I guess, symmetry composition, we perform one symmetry, H on X, and then we perform a second symmetry, G, on that result. What that course, that, that's acting on the element X, right? But what that corresponds to is simply multiplying elements of the group together. So if you multiply two elements of a group, that is like the same thing as applying one symmetry and then the next symmetry. Kind of how like in linear algebra, that this might be a good analogy right here for, for this property, which is sometimes called the, combat, the compatibility axiom or property. But a good analogy is that let's say with the remaining room that I have left on the whiteboard, let's say that I have two matrices A and B. And this is assuming that we're familiar with linear algebra, right? But let's say I have two matrices A, A and B, and I want to act it on a vector X. If, if we think of matrices as just linear transformations that manipulate, maybe rotate or stretch or reflect X in some way, then the act of applying the first linear transformation, B, and then the second linear transformation, A, is the same thing as just multiplying the two matrices together and then acting it on whatever X is. So it's kind of just allowing uh, for, for composition of symmetries in this last requirement right here. Okay. And, and admittedly, we might be like, why, why go through all this? <laughs> and and I, I understand that for sure. I, I think the, the reason why why I like looking at the notation for theta is because when we look at the simplified notation for a group action, when we look at this g of x equals y, this right here does not look like our original group action definition for phi, right? Because phi took in an element from the group and it spit out an element of sim of x. But nowhere do we see a Greek letter in here, right? So, so in our head, when, when we see this, g of x equals y, to represent a group action, we might be like, how does this correspond to this? Right? So, so there might be an initial disconnect if we don't go through all the steps. 
But when we look at this other function, theta, just by looking at the domain and codomain of theta, it makes it much more apparent, at least in my opinion, for why this notation is clear. Let me write theta up here real quick. Theta takes g cross x into x, right? And little g belongs to the group g, little x belongs to the set x, and y belongs to the set x. So this simplified notation that we use to describe a group action can be clearly seen when we think of the definition of a group action in terms of this theta function as opposed to this phi function. So it's, it's kind of like, uh, and this will be to summarize everything. I think phi, when we think of the group action in terms of phi, that really conveys the idea that a group action, an element of the group, or I should say an element of the group, corresponds to a symmetry. You take in a group element, you get a symmetry out of it. So the, the phi definition really conveys that conceptual idea. But then in, in practice, when we actually want to look at group actions and we use the notation of element of a group acts on element of a set to produce element of a new set, now the, the, the definition in terms of theta seems to make more sense just because the domain and codomain really match the simplified structure that, that we're talking about. Okay, so, so that's why both of them are useful. They both serve their purpose. And because this is an if and only if statement, whether we think about a group action in terms of the phi definition or the theta definition, both are equally equivalent. Okay. So anyways, that, I, that's simply the, the next way we can think of a group action. Hopefully the motivation for why we care about both of those makes sense. Now, what I'm gonna do, I'm going to erase the board. This is a lot of just general stuff for what a group action is. We're gonna finish off the video by doing some examples. And, and hopefully, if this is still a bit unclear, then we'll make it, uh, we'll solidify these ideas um, coming up next. Okay, so, so now to go on to some examples. I wanna start, I think, because this is abstract enough as it is, I wanna start with what we call the trivial action. And with this example, as well as probably for, for the rest of the video, I wanna go through the, the kind of the abstract or the, the general way according to the definition of how to look at a group action as well as that simplified notation so we can see the connection between the, the two ways of expressing a group action. But, but let's take a look at this thing here called the trivial action. Trivial action. And the, the idea behind this is that let's suppose we have just some general group G, and then some general set X. And we want to perform a, a group action of G on the set X. Well, if we want to do that, according to the definition of what a group action is, and let's write this down again, it's a homomorphism phi, which goes from G into the symmetries of X. What, what we could do then is that if phi is this, this group action, and this is a homomorphism, it will take in an element from the domain or a group element, whatever that group element is, little g, and it needs to spit out some corresponding symmetry, some symmetry on the, the set of the elements of x. So, uh, what, so we can say, okay, sure, but, but what would it mean for for this action, this specific function phi to be the trivial action. In other words, what would be the function that just acts, I guess, I guess trivially? And typically, it, when we think of something that uh, acts trivially, we like when, when we're thinking of the the symmetries of like the triangle, for example, we could ask ourselves, what's the the trivial symmetry of the triangle? And that's just the identity element e, right? That's the that's the element which rotates the triangle by zero degrees. It just kind of picks it up and puts it right back where it started. The do nothing symmetry, if you will. So we wanna emulate that idea here when talking about the trivial group action. So for whatever, and, and here's how we would do that. For whatever element G we have, it would spit out what would be the identity, uh, identity symmetry 
for, for sim of x. After all, this is a group, right? So we can write simply the identity right here, where E is the identity element in sim of x. Now this can be still a little bit abstract because we want to say, okay, phi of g takes in E, and E itself is a symmetry, but let's see how this would actually act on an element of the set, because this is what we're going to be seeing in, in the upcoming videos. So, so here's how we would do this. Phi of g takes in an element of the set little x, and if, if this is the trivial action, then whatever group element we have, and maybe it would even be useful to, to draw some bubbles here, g sim of x, and then I just have an arbitrary group element, and then maybe I have the identity, I have some different permutation sigma, maybe I have another one tau over here, and it keeps on going. And maybe I'll just do g1, g2, g3, like this, so we get a visual. The, the trivial action would say whatever element from the domain we have, they're all going to map to the identity element in the codomain. So whatever g is here, that's going to map to the identity symmetry in the codomain. And what does the identity symmetry do to any element? Because after all, this is a function. E is going to be a function that takes, let's even write this here. Uh, e is a function that takes x into x, right? So whatever little x is in our set, how will this act uh, on, how will E act on little x? Well, if it's the identity element, it effectively does nothing, right? So uh, this is what the, the trivial action would be right here. Okay. Now, this is using kind of this, this generalized definition or this general definition for the group action in terms of the homomorphism phi. Let's now use the simplified notation uh, to, to see how the notation corresponds to this trivial action right here. Because after all, the, let's first ask ourselves, what is the uh, simplified notation? It's to say, rather than write out phi of g of x, we simply say, how does a group element g take in a set element x and how does it how does it act on x what is what does it do under the the rules of of this specified as a symmetry well if it's trivial then whatever g is and for whatever x is g of x is simply going to be x and i think using this notation the simplified notation it can become clearer for why we call this the trivial action it is the action such that whatever group element we have, it does nothing when, when it takes in a, a set element. And you can imagine, maybe, maybe take specific examples, like, like the dihedral group. Imagine this is um, a, a, an element of D6, and this could be one of the little vertices of the triangle. And, and if, if it spits out, uh, what's it called? If it spits out that same exact element, this the corresponding action would be the action that just leaves the triangle intact, as if we did not move it in the first place. Okay. So this would be probably the the most trivial example in the sense we call it the trivial action. Okay. Hopefully this is starting to make sense. I'm going to erase the board, and we're going to keep going with examples. I think examples are going to be really useful in this video. Okay, so now I, I think to, to finish out the video, I wanna go through an example that one is mentioned in Dexter's notes, but then also another one to show that you can have a group that acts on a set, but that does not imply that there is only a single corresponding group action. We'll show that there are two different types, well, not just two, but we will show at least two different types of group actions and then there are other ones that you could construct as well but in this case the the group that we're going to be looking at is inherently the symmetric group sn and it will act on the set 
of n elements, one, or yeah, set of n elements, which we're going to denote as x. So what would at least one type of group action be? And maybe I'll split the board. Well, if we start with our, our sort of definition for the group action, we know that we need to come up with a homomorphism phi, which takes in an element from G and maps to sim of X. But now let's just ask ourselves what, what both the domain and the codomain are in this case. So maybe let me just make one more line here. What is the domain G? Well, we're saying that the group that is doing the acting is itself SN. So that's the domain. And then for the codomain, sim of X, the, if X has N elements, then sim of X is, is simply all going to be SN as well. So in this specific instance, and this is probably why they, they introduced this as another example, because this is a relatively straightforward example as well. So in this instance, phi is this function that has the same domain and codomain. So let's suppose now that phi takes in an element, sigma, like this, where sigma is some permutation in Sn, and we need it to map to some other element in Sn as well. What would be the most obvious choice for what, what the output should be? And then hopefully we can imagine the most obvious choice is to say that whatever input we have, that should also be the corresponding output. In other words, every element of here, every element of this group corresponds to permuting these n elements in the set right here. That is what this is effectively saying. Now, of course, again, sigma in itself is a permutation. So sigma will map from x into x. And let's just suppose that, let's do this. Let's suppose that if sigma acts on a number i, where i is just one of the n different numbers in this set, it's going to map to some other element, j. Where, where i and j both are elements of x. If that's the case, if we were to actually write this out in the full form, then we would have phi of sigma, and then this itself acts on i. That would be the same thing as sigma acts on i, which is j. And almost this seems to act trivially in the sense, because you can imagine, let's, let's take this and rewrite this in the more compact notation. Rather than writing phi of sigma of i, we can simply just write sigma of i. And when we do that, we have sigma of i equals itself, which equals j. Under this instance, we would say that phi acts, uh, acts g on x through permutation. All right? So every element of here does kind of what its intended job was. Right? If, if the intended job of the elements of Sn are to permute these objects, kind of one of the most straightforward actions is if each of the elements in this group permutes these n elements in the set the way that it was it was uh, defined to, right? So kind of a trivial example, which is why I want to go through one more. Let's say that we still have, let's come up with another homomorphism, and maybe I shouldn't call it phi, maybe I'll call it, I hesitate to call it theta just because of the other notation. Maybe I'll call it phi prime. Phi prime. And we want to come up with another homomorphism, or in other words, another group action for how this group right here acts on this set. So we still need it to be going from G into uh, sim of X. But maybe rather than saying that phi of a permutation is just itself, maybe let's do this. Let's suppose we have another element of our group right here. So let's say that we have a tau in Sn. Then what we could do is, is we could also then say that phi prime of sigma equals tau sigma tau inverse, like this. Notice this is, is different than just 
phi, or phi prime is different than phi, right? Because phi of sigma here is just sigma. Now, how do we know that this would be a group action? Well, we, we would need to uh, first, well, according to the definition, we would need to check that this function phi prime is a homomorphism from g into sim of x. We already know the function from g into sim of x, so now we would just need to check that it's a homomorphism. So to do that, we would just apply the definition of a homomorphism, right? So phi prime of sigma one, sigma two, equals phi prime of sigma one times phi prime of sigma two. And then we say, okay, well, what's the left-hand side? And whatever the output is, you, you just take, or whatever your input is, just multiply it on the left by tau and on the right by tau inverse, and we get tau sigma one, sigma two, tau inverse. And then on the right, this first term is going to be tau sigma one, tau inverse. So you can see this. And then the second term is going to be tau sigma two, tau inverse. We have tau sigma two, tau inverse. Tau inverse tau cancels out, and then we're left with tau sigma one, sigma two, tau inverse which is the same thing as the left-hand side. Therefore, we have found another group action for the same group acting on the same set, okay? So, so this, this is, is part of, of why we have such a general definition to show that just because we could define a trivial, or I wanna say a trivial action, that was the previous example, but kind of the straightforward action for this group in this set via permutation, there are other actions that we could define as well. And what we're gonna see later on in the video series is, is that there are gonna be specific cases of combinations of groups and sets and specific corresponding actions that will be particularly useful and particularly interesting to study. The, the case that we'll be interested in primarily, although it's not the only one, is where we coincidentally have the same, whatever group we have, that acts on itself. In other words, the set happens to be the same as the group. So here they're different, right? Because the group is Sn and the set is N elements. But we'll be interested, as, as we'll see, in cases where maybe the group is Sn and the set is also Sn. So when we have a group acting on itself, we'll see that there are very specific type of group actions that we'll find useful. Okay. And, and in order to do that, we, we need to be able to, to generalize from the idea that just because we have some set and some set of elements where it seems like there's an obvious choice, it is obvious that we would want a permutation on el n elements to correspond to permuting those n elements. This right here is what we would obviously choose up until maybe section two in the video series. Just showing that there are other ways to do this is necessary if we wanna talk about um, these things called uh, conjugate actions, uh, multiplication to the left, uh, could have multiplication to the right, but, but various different actions at least. Um, and this is just the start of that, okay? But I, I don't want to make this video too long. I, I, I know this can already be, be dense enough, and I think it's probably a good point to stop. Uh, so th this is really just the start, too. We're going to be taking everything we've learned up until this point. In the next video, we're really going to apply it to start learning about these things called orbits and stabilizers and get eventually into the orbit stabilizer theorem. Uh, so good stuff. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for watching, and I will uh, see you in the next one.